All right. Well, gosh, I'm so inspired by um, our previous speakers. Definitely seems that we are all kind of in a mental alignment here with um, our thoughts and it's nice to hear and to imagine that some of our thoughts are overlapping. And I hope that that helps to um, comfort you as we move uh, forward in this uh, project really um, toward uh, beginning to take the next steps to tangible and meaningful preparation to teach clinical judgment in a really focused and purposeful and hopefully effective way. Um, of course, as, a, as an educator, I do have a few objectives, but uh, really looking at that, the three circles there and, and thinking about how when we are going to be trying to apply some of these ideas about teaching uh, more intentionally clinical judgment in the classroom, that today is kind of a balcony view of first steps, things to be thinking about as you embark on this, on this uh, process. And so overall, preparing our classroom to be a more inviting and low threat, but high outcome environment will be one of the things we talk about today. And preparing ourselves to be ready to use a clinical judgment process, meaning we will have to pick one. Um, generally speaking, most of the speakers today have you know, strongly encouraged that. And so we'll have to prepare ourselves um, with whichever one uh, we choose. And then preparing our teaching materials and approaches um, and to be kind of keeping in mind, you know, the outcome of preparing an entry level nurse. Um, what information are you teaching that is really uh, the way the nurse uses the information? And therefore, as, as Lisa's group just said, applying context to all of your teaching materials and, and your teaching approaches. And so we'll begin um, just by thinking a little bit and just try to relax and think about your own personal experiences of, you know, why do you embark on an educational uh, endeavor? Why did you earn a master's degree or why did you, you know, earn your initial nursing degree? And for most of us, it related to, you know, you wanted to fill, fill a gap. Maybe you wanted to get a job that was more meaningful. Um, you had information that you needed to know in order to advance in your career. And maybe it was just overall curiosity. You know, you wanted to, you were a very curious learner and you wanted to um, tap into something that you've always wondered about. And when we think about our own personal students and their motivation to learn, you know, it's kind of like a superpower if we can tap into that, which has motivated our students to spend the money to be in the seats in our classrooms and to really tap into that curiosity. Um, and as we prepare our materials to really be thinking about how can we energize and excite our students um, about the materials that we are teaching. And research has shown that um, high curiosity students will ask more questions and be more curious in a low threat environment. And, you know, after all, isn't this what we're trying to achieve? So it's really important that we try to create a classroom that's engaging and inviting. Um, research has also shown that anxiety, you know, blocks learning. So if students are feeling anxious about the ways that you're teaching in the classroom, we really need to be aware of that. And um, of course, research also tells us about how to reduce anxiety in the classroom and give us suggestions like scaffolding old information with new information and giving specific and guided feedback when a student offers um, a suggestion or an answer to a question that you value their attempt to answer the question and that you provide specific feedback to that student. When I think about written materials students are submitting, I want to provide feedback that each individual student feels that I'm addressing them and, and uh, kind of honoring the hard work that they've done. We're building trust in the classroom. And one way to build trust in the classroom is to talk a little bit about yourselves. Talk about your past, talk about your journey, 
talk about why the topic excites you. And you may do this by using some discussion-based pedagogical uh, strategies, such as storytelling. Now, I use a lot of storytelling in my teaching. I teach uh, pathopharmacology at the University of Maryland. That is a uh, undergraduate or pre-licensure course. Um, and uh, for many years, I taught med surge and um, I did a lot of storytelling and the feedback that I get from my students about my stories, of course, that are very intentionally designed and always have a little bit of an affective element to them is that they remember those stories 10 and now 20 years later. And why is that? Well, research implicates that stories are stored in the brain in a different way. They are thought to be stored in long-term memory rather than short-term memory. They also allow you to apply context to a topic that you're teaching. And um, so it's really, you know, uh, seems like a, a sort of simple uh, strategy, storytelling, but it really has deep impact um, on, on your students and long lasting impact. Asking open-ended questions and, and being really comfortable that you could ask questions that may not have a specific answer. Um, and as a faculty, you know, being very open about that. Like, here's a question I've always had, and I really don't know the answer. And it's important, too, to um, think about, you know, demonstrating that we ourselves are curious and that we ourselves are not um, intimidated by not knowing the answer to something. Um, other ways to make students feel less anxious and more comfortable in your classroom are include um, social strategies, such as having prior students maybe talk to that group of students in the very first class and talk about the success strategies that they use that um, really enhance their success in your course. If not, if you can't logistically, that's a hard thing to do. You can take note in your uh, course evaluations what prior students said about what helped them to learn and share that with your new students, your incoming students. And really share a sense of hope for the future that you're confident that with hard work, your students are going to be successful in your course. And the course I teach, Pathopharmacology, you know, is a course where students feel quite intimidated um, and afraid and anxious, bringing along with them their past experiences in classrooms. Um, and so it's even more important, right, in those classes that are deemed to be, you know, very difficult. Promoting a sense of belonging in your classroom, so having everyone introduce themselves and share something that's unique about them. Um, I use a discussion board in my course because I have 99 students. <laughs> but if you have a smaller section, you know, to do some type of an icebreaker, to really engage each student, they get to know each other. Um, if you use a discussion board like I do, I'm still working my way through each introduction and I comment on each introduction in a very unique and um, interested way of uh, commenting. Um, try to have fun and model excitement in your topic. You know, it's really um, important that for the affective, affective element of learning that, you know, you are engaged with the topic um, as, as much as possible um, using uh, gestures or changing your voice um, inflection. Um, very important to interact with the students' um, mood and experience in the classroom um, in order to engage them and make them feel as comfortable as possible. And lastly, in the literature, uh, we see this term pedagogical caring and, and how to demonstrate in the classroom that you care for your individual students for me, I show up about 15 to 20 minutes early. Um, some of the students really enjoy that. Um, they make a point of getting there early. Um, they want to tell me about their weekend. My class is on Monday morning. So um, sometimes I share a little bit about my weekend. Um, I also arrive very well prepared. 
So teaching a difficult topic like pathopharmacology requires, you know, often that I am reviewing materials. I'm trying very hard to do that on Friday before class on Monday. Um, For many years, I did it on Sunday afternoon, but really showing the students that you are very well prepared, that you've kind of thought about the really difficult uh, concepts and how to explain them more than one way, anticipating that students will have questions about the really difficult concepts. And so integrating authenticity into your classroom and, you know, just a little reminder that long three-hour lectures are not authentic. They're, they do not, um, you know, engage students in a meaningful and exciting way. Um, some ways to integrate authenticity is to include as much fidelity as possible, meaning that you have a lot of context in your lecture materials and in your PowerPoints, especially. So I'm lean towards being more of a visual learner. So um, seeing images that really uh, tie to the topic that I am um, learning about as a learner and teaching about as a teacher. Um, so having a very realistic image or picture um, in your PowerPoint, uh, maybe even with a little bit of a sensitivity warning, if you're teaching something that's medical and it is a shocking or disturbing image, that you are being very uh, thoughtful about letting your students know that you're going to be showing an image maybe of a difficult wound healing situation or a difficult um, fracture, for example, that might, you might call that a trigger warning. I call that really more of a, just a context warning that students are aware that that is coming. Um, And I try to teach, uh, treat all of my students as if they are future scholars that they are um, there with the intent to learn and many of them to advance their education um, and hopefully in the future beyond their entry level education. Um, And so integrating authenticity in our materials is really very important. In my course in pathopharmacology, I every semester go through YouTube and just try to find you know, a day in the life of someone with the disease process that I am discussing. And that may just show a little 15 or 20 second little vignette. Uh, I may turn the sound off and just have the students look at what that patient looks like, just really to intentionally place um, really meaningful context into all of your materials. And you know, recognizing that as we introduce more opportunities for students to extend themselves in the classroom, that we know they're going to make mistakes and that we have to come at it and really actually overtly say to the student, this is going to be hard and you're going to make mistakes. And that's okay because we learn so much more by our mistakes um, than by you know always getting straight A's, right? We, we learn so much more And sometimes you can talk about your mistakes as a faculty and what you have learned. Maybe share a story uh, as a as a clinical nurse or in one of your practice settings that really outlines that you know we are human and we all make mistakes and what I learned from that, and that um, allows the students to know that growth is um, incumbent upon failure. So we do not grow without um, making mistakes and learning from them. I also am a big believer in the concept of grit and um, that grit involves sustained effort. And some of our students are extremely overextended with work and uh, family responsibilities, childcare. It's really hard to have sustained effort when your bandwidth, your bandwidth is really reduced by all of those, um, excuse me, I'm sorry about that, by all of those outside commitments. Um, Be aware of the cognitive load of the topic that you're teaching. So showing caring in the classroom really is faculty recognizing, you know, how difficult is the topic that you're teaching and kind of spread out and mix in the difficult concepts with the sort of less difficult content recognizing that there should be a balance, right? We're in a pre-licensure program and 
um, we are preparing entry level generalists. So it's important that we um, think about how difficult is the content that I am teaching. So other ways to kind of attack a difficult or heavy cognitive load would be to maybe do a little pre-quiz before you uh, do your teaching session, maybe just four or five questions that kind of cues the students into, um, okay, this is the type of content that Dr. Martin is getting ready to present. Let me cue my brain in. It kind of primes the pump, if you will. And then maybe the same four or five questions at the end, a little post quiz so that they can kind of say, okay, wow, all right, I did maybe answer a couple more correctly than I did in the pretest, of course. Another strategy would be to offer fewer lower stakes tests or quizzes uh, versus, you know, just four large uh, tests. And so, you know, why is this important that we, we think about this? Well, Students are going to be pushed to take risks when we're making clinical judgments for the first time. And this may be occurring in the classroom. This, it's very difficult to integrate this into our exams or our quizzes right now. The software is just kind of not quite there yet. But we can begin to um, integrate some of these ideas into our classroom, which, of course, we'll have a whole session on that coming up. But um, you know, we want students to take risks and they're not going to take risks if they feel unsupported and afraid. All right, so now we're going to uh, think about the next step. So we heard from all of our speakers so far that your program really should be thinking about choosing a clinical judgment process um, and how to integrate that across your curriculum. And then now how do we integrate the idea of um, more active learning strategies you know, into our classroom, strategies that are going to involve engagement with students um, in a different way. And so, you know, here we've talked about creating an inviting and welcoming classroom environment. Now we're going to talk about adding more active learning pedagogies, which we'll have in a future session. But what I want you to think about today is, you know, how do I assess where I am today? Um, and so in a future session, we're going to, you know, we'll talk about some various active learning strategies and ways to um, teach students how to think in action, how to model curiosity. Um, but let's start today with that big picture view of, you know, where do I begin by assessing the amount of active learning and engagement? You can, might even just substitute engagement if that you're more comfortable with that into your classroom. And so this is a table that's a very straightforward sort of way to do your own personal course level assessment. I um, learned about this while taking a Quality Matters um, professional development course on active learning. And I thought this was really very straightforward. So simply using a, a table like this one below to sort of analyze what are the learning activities that you're currently using in your course to determine kind of how to maybe make some adjustments where adjustments are needed. And having learners interacting with each other is really kind of where the money is, right? So we're going to begin then in um, the first column by mapping your course level objectives to your current activities that you're using. So you have your course level objective, um, maybe you have your module or unit level objective for a particular class, and list the um, activities that you're currently using in the next column over. And then thinking about, you know, sort of attacking um, your, um, the way that you know that your students learn, learning preferences, auditory, visual, and tactile, and thinking about, you know, what are you addressing with your current learning activities? And then in the last column, just sort of identifying, well, I really could be fub, my engagement and interactive engagement um, learner to learner in this particular area. This will help you to sort of recognize where you are today um, and where now moving down and wanting to add more clinical judgment activities to our um, toolkit, right, of what we do in the classroom, um, where you are today and where 
in each class, you might add um, an active learning activity or clinical judgment activity. Now, moving to the third goal then of, you know, taking our learning materials and kind of making them more um, active and sort of we're going to be starting to add some activities that might allow the students to make clinical judgments in the classroom. Think about how you include clinical context in every learning activity. I have this slide in my PowerPoints. This is actually from, you know, last Monday's class that sort of wraps up each subsection. I call those little mini lecturettes, you know, like a scrambled classroom approach. When I'm talking about a topic in pathophysiology, maybe 10 or 15 minutes on a particular topic. And then I have this slide. How will you, and I, I, struggled with how to word this, but I wanted to word it so that the students would see themselves in the slide. So I worded it, how will you use this information as a registered nurse? And then this allowed me then to go into the clinical context of the information that I was sharing. And so really encouraging you to reflect every 15 or 20 minutes in class and kind of wrap up whatever topic you're, you've just finished teaching with a clinical contextual um, trigger. And it could be a story. It could be, you know, uh, for me in my first week's class, I included how a nurse would uh, evaluate uh, the white blood cell count and how they would calculate an, an, you know, an absolute count from a differential. So this you know, allowed me to kind of apply some really very black and white content into how a nurse uses this information in day-to-day -day life. Another example of a simple strategy, some that you might even start using this fall, is to think about, you know, how do nurses organize information? And my students ask that, me that all the time. How, I ask them how clinical is going, and, and I don't teach the clinical course, but that's a, like a sister course to mine. So Monday morning, one of my, you know, number one things to ask is how did clinical go last week? And feedback that I get from the students is, you know, how do the nurses organize so much information? So that really got me thinking that I really need to teach them how to organize information. And one way to do that would be when you're teaching two similar concepts. And for me this week, it's rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. I encourage them to draw a Venn diagram and to compare uh, the unique characteristics of one and the unique characteristics with the other and then what are the characteristics that they have in common in the middle of that Venn diagram? And they loved that. They needed a tangible way. It seems simple, I know, but a tangible way to organize their information. Now, another way to organize would be to uh, organize nursing interventions. Perhaps you're teaching about a set of nursing interventions for a particular diagnosis. Well, you can see here that you can list the nursing interventions, but we really, in order to prepare our students to be able to answer these next generation types of NCLEX questions, we need to help them to understand priority and priority setting. So in Med Surge, if I were teaching that class, I might list the nursing interventions and then identify which are the highest priority which are the lower priorities, things that can wait. Um, also in one of the next generation item types, they will have a column that's not appropriate or contraindicated. Um, and so think, what, what does this table remind you of, right? Which NGN type item does this look like? So this is exactly an example of a matrix uh, type item. And also, you know, teaching your students how to prioritize, organize, and make choices must include the rationale and references. So students should be able to go back right to their reference to see, you know, where you got that information from, modeling 
how if you know how they can use their textbook resources and other resources to uh, gain perspective about priority setting. Okay. And so this is one of the other uh, NGN item types. This is called a bow tie item type. And this is straight from one of the flyers um, that I, I put the link in the chat box earlier to. These are, this is one of the two uh, standalone item types. And so how I like to look at this bow tie item type because it kind of shows us the way in the classroom, how we can teach kind of so that we are promoting our students' ability to make better clinical judgments in those clinical settings and simulation and, and when they're working as techs and nursing assistants. And so this bow tie type, you know, promotes or requires really that the students answer in the middle, what is the condition that the case is describing? Well, remembering that then when we're teaching about similar diagnoses, we have to recognize that students are going to have to be able to have enough information to differentiate between those similar neurological conditions, for example, and, and pick which one they think is, is what's going on with that patient. On the left of this bow tie item, this is exactly what I was referring to in the previous slide. From a list of nursing interventions, they will have to choose the top two priority interventions or actions. And so this bow tie kind of shows us the importance of teaching in the classroom priority setting and what are the highest priorities. And then on the right, it teaches the student or tests the student, it informs us as educators that tied to that action, the student needs to recognize what is the evaluation outcome that I need to measure so whenever we're teaching about an intervention, we also must remember how will the nurse know if the patient is getting better, responding to the intervention in a positive way or not. And so this bow tie is a really great study if you wanted to sort of, if you're learning about this and you wanted to begin somewhere, I would begin by, by looking over this bow tie and imagining how can I teach in the classroom so that the student can address this item type? All right, and so as we're wrapping up, um, we need to remember that, you know, we as faculty who teach in the classroom are wanting to teach uh, in a deep way and that students are learning our material in a deep way. And um, this Ken Bain uh, wrote a book that I read in 2004, called What the Best College Teachers Do. And it's a, it's a required reading for all, all faculty, I think. And it was required where I taught at the time um, to read. And he says that we are just not teaching so that students remember stuff for an examination, right? We are teaching so they can analyze, synthesize, and solve problems. Doesn't that resonate with exactly what we're doing? Um, to try to modify our teaching approaches so that we can begin to incorporate the teaching of clinical judgment in the classroom. And the National Council says, graduates must be self-regulated thinkers. They must direct their own inquiry. They must determine what questions to ask to obtain the information that they need. And so, I think the, this slide resonates with me as this is why, this is our goal. And overall, you know, uh, as, as nurse educators, we are teaching our students to be nurses with good clinical judgment skills that will have a positive impact on our patient outcomes because we know that if they don't, our students as entry-level graduates uh, lack clinical judgment skills, they will fail to recognize clinical deterioration and it will compromise uh, patient outcomes. And so back to our objectives for the beginning um, of the session today as we are wrapping up the session that I hope that you feel that you have begun the process now of understanding how to create a more inviting learning environment. We're going to have a session just dedicated to that, more on that. Uh, ways to utilize a, 
a clinical judgment process in the classroom. And of course, we'll have more on that. And also how to include kin clinical context in all of our content. I have a few um, resources that I use to prepare today's presentation to share with you. Uh, some of them look familiar um, to the others as well. So I am going to um, end the slideshow now and um, unshare my materials. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, it reminds me of a book that really <clears throat> jumped out at me that was published in 2009 by Patricia Benner and, and other colleagues called The Educating Nurses, A Call for Radical Transformation. And it talks about salience in the classroom. And salience means how it relates to clinical and how are you going to use that information when you get into a clinical setting. So it really just resonates. And thank you so much. If there are there any I don't see anything at the moment. We'll we'll catch up questions at the uh, next. 